you so much all for being here. Um, I hope you had a great first day and welcome back for the second day, which I get to open. Um, so that's great. And I'm usually a little bit high energy, so I hope you got your coffees in. Um, also, I was going to open with, I totally forgot already, Zdrasti. Is that? Oh, oh, that worked. OK, cool. <laughs> Bing, Bing Translate didn't fill me here, so that's good. Um, perfect. And today we're going to talk about um, real-time connected apps with .NET MAUI, which I love, uh, Blazor, and SignalR. So we'll learn all about that. Actually, let's do a little, there's going to be a little poll uh, after this, but who already worked with .NET MAUI? Oh, good, good, good. Xamarin before this? Perfect. Blazor? SignalR? What are you doing here? You already know all this stuff. All right. Cool. So who am I then? Um, my name is Gerald Verslaus. No, it's Verslaus, but no one can pronounce that outside of the Netherlands. Um, I live in the Netherlands and I work remotely um, for Microsoft on the .NET MAUI team. So that's what I do. Um, I'm a software engineer, so uh, but I love doing this stuff as well and interact with all of you and and you know get some feedback and and share the love basically. I also do, like Liz already said, some stuff on YouTube with this um, mostly .NET MAUI, some Blazor, some other stuff. Um, so if that's something that you like as well, then go like and subscribe and do all the things that influencers want you to do. So today we're going to talk about um, real-time, well, ASP.NET, that's weird. We're, we just saw all this other stuff, right? Um, but Signal R comes from originally um, the ASP.NET space. Um, that's where it was invented, if you will. Um, and it still lives there because Blazor, you know, it's, it's kind of like out of touch. We don't really market it that way, I think. I'm not really sure. I'm not a marketing person. Um, but it still lives in like the ASP.NET world, right? It's built on top of everything that ASP.NET has. Um, and it is incredibly simple, real-time web for ASP.NET, but not just ASP.NET anymore. Um, because you can also use it with .NET MAUI and Blazor and all kinds of other stuff, as we will see in a little bit. So what is things that you can do with this? Well, you can use it for all kinds of scenarios, like the all, well, I'm not going to say all the apps that you see that have real-time updates now are using SignalR, unfortunately. Um, there's other technologies like this, obviously, that will do kind of the same thing. But SignalR is the best, right? Um, but you know, if you're using Microsoft products with real-time updates, then chances are that that is using SignalR, because it has been around for a long time already. So if you think of scenarios like co-authoring, so you had like, I'm, I'm not sure if that's even still a thing. You had like Visual Studio Live Share, right, where you could um, write code you know, remotely and, and have multiple cursors, or now you have Microsoft Loop, or you can work together in your Word document online, and you go crazy with all the little cursors with the initials on top of it going everywhere. Um, that can run on SignalR. That's probably something, if you're working with Microsoft products, that's implemented by SignalR. Um, Real-time location-based tracking. So I tried to get an Uber here in Sofia. Apparently, that's not a thing. Um, but there's, I think there's another. Is, there, is, there, is that the yellow thing? Um, is that, well, anyway, I think you have a app for taxis, and you can maybe see where they are um, driving to you. Um, so you can do that with Signal R, right? Because on the one side, you know, probably the driver has the app to receive a request for, hey, I want to be picked up. Um, and that app is going to be open all the time. So it can send the location up to a server, and that server can push it down to your app while you're waiting, providing you with real time updates and getting that inside of your app. A perfect example of this real-time stuff. Um, In-app notifications. Now, this is always when I talk about the context of .NET MAUI and real-time updates and Signal R. The question always comes up, so I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be ahead of this. Um, can you use this for push notifications? And the answer is no. Right? Um, it kind of depends on how you define push notifications, um, because you can use it for in-app notifications. But if you talk, if I talk about push notifications, um, then I talk about the thing that's integrated into the OS, right? Push notifications are part of Android, of iOS, Windows 2, um, and that are channels that are um, managed by Microsoft and Apple and Google, which is a good thing um, because, you know, they want to keep that very secure because if that gets hacked, then people can start sending uh, all kinds of weird push notifications. Some apps are already doing that, uh, sending you spam, but then maybe third parties would go into that as well. Um, and they have this whole infrastructure on uh, listening for push notifications and, and, you know, things coming in to save battery life and that kind of stuff. While this Signal R or any other um, technology for that matter is, 
you know, that gets killed whenever your app gets killed, right? So in-app notifications, as long as the connection is there, as long as your app is open, yes, you can push connection, uh, you can push uh, notifications to your client. Um, but if the app is gone, then the connection is gone and you can't do it like that. So that's something to take into account and always needs a little bit of explanation for people who are kind of new to this space. So there's that. And then, of course, you can, you know, live dashboard is kind of like more of the same thing. You can push all these new things. So if you are the CEO of Uber and you want to see all the cars everywhere, you can have this dashboard in your office and you can see all the real-time updates that way. So what is Signal R? Well, it is a wrapper around kind of like standardized web uh, technologies that have been around for a long time. And the really cool thing is, is that um, it has like a lot of things. Like it, 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 it wraps, um, well, all the technologies. Did I list them here? No, we'll see that in the next slide. Um, but it will pick the best one that is available on, you know, whatever client you're connecting from. And then it will gracefully fall back to other technologies, older technologies usually, um, whenever it's not available but you as the developer don't notice anything. You don't have to know about these protocols. It's always good to know what's going on under the hood, how it works, um, but you don't necessarily have to. Um, the connection will just work, right? And it will, you know, it will become near real time instead of actual real time. Um, but you know, there's, there's slight things that you will, might notice, but typically you don't have to worry about it and it will go automatically. And the really cool thing is, I already said it, like, you know, this is ASP.NET, but it's also more. It's not even just available for C-sharp. It's also available for F-sharp. It's also available for Visual uh, Basic, even um, Java, um, JavaScript, right? Like it came from ASP.NET when Blazor wasn't around, so we can do this for JavaScript as well, um, because it's open source and open protocol, right? So if you have your own programming language or you're like, no, I'm a fan of Rust, I don't know what's, what uh, new kids are using these days, um, and I want to do it with that, maybe there's something already, um, but you can totally implement it yourself if that's what you want, right, for some kind of obscure exotic language that you might be using. Um, so there's that. It's all out in the open, and you can do everything with that. Um, so this is like kind of like all the technologies that it uses under the hood. It starts with WebSockets, which is the hip new thing, um, and that's the best thing that you can use um, whenever you want to do things with um, long-standing connections. But you know, if that's not there on the client for whatever reason, you're using an older browser or you're using I don't know whatever the reason is, it will automatically start going through the technologies and see like, hey, can I use this? Can I use this? Um, and it will still connect and it will still do all the things, mostly. So that's great. Um, so if you're actually going to use this, this is kind of like how it looks. I'm used to being more walking around and pointing to things, but that's a little bit hard here. So um, I'm just going to describe the best I can. So on the left side, we have like the um, um, hub, right? It, the server, you always going to have a server, right? Because there has to be a persistent connection for you to be able to push things uh, through that to the client or from the client back. So you're going to have to have that server. And in the Signal R world, that is called a hub. Um, so you're going to have that hub, and that's where you're going to to implement like functionality to either you know um, execute code on the server side uh, whenever you receive a signal, or you're going to have uh, calls to um, broadcast or or send something to a specific client and um, send that to your client to push that real time data. So uh, we have that hub, we have that server on the left side. It's typically probably going to be an ASP.NET server, but again, it's all open source, open protocol. It can be anything basically. Um, so we have that, and then you can just say, hey, I have that my server function on the left left, right? Um, uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. And if you go to your clients, then you can just say, hey, clients.client. .client. So you can reach all your clients if you want. You can reach that specific client, as we see in a little bit of pseudo code right here, uh, with just a single ID. You can say, hey, I want to um, reach the caller client, so the one that is actually making the call. There's all kinds of helper methods there to help you um, kind of like filter the right clients out there. So for instance, if you're building a chat client, um, if you have like a one-on-one -on -one chat, you want to send that chat to a specific ID, right? Um, and you can also send like, hey, I want to send this to everyone except um, the caller, because if you're going to have this chat message and you're going to get your own messages back, that's also weird, right? So you don't want to do that. Um, excuse me. And if you have a group chat, then you want to maybe group um, clients as well. You can totally do that. You can add uh, authentication to this if that's what you need. So everything is available to make this super secure and um, filter the right 
people, uh, set of people out here. And you're going to send that to a hub proxy because, you know, it's good to have some kind of idea um, what the functionality is that is available on the server. So what are the um, uh, methods that I can call? Um, what are the parameters that I can expect? So there is a little proxy object on the client side, um, which will help you kind of like receive the signals and execute code and uh, vice versa also send uh, methods. Uh, so you know what is available. So if you do it the other way around, then it's like, hey, I've, I received the signal. But you can also say hub connection because, again, you're going to build that connection and that's going to stay there. And then you can say send async. And then you're going to send like a, a magic string, unfortunately. Like if you use bare bones uh, signal R, it's going to be a lot of magic strings um, because, you know, it can be executed from anywhere. Um, and you're going to say, hey, this is my function. So in this case, my server function. Um, and we can see on the left side, right, that that is available. Um, we can execute that on the hub side. So again, if you uh, place this in kind of like a chat application, application mode, um, then um, you can now send a message like, hey, I sent um, a text message to a friend, and then the server is going to receive that and send that back to the right clients. So that's kind of like how it works. It sounds a little bit abstract like this. We'll see a code in a little bit, and then um, it will hopefully all become clear. Um, there's also the Azure Signal R service. So um, this, you know, if you, I, I, I typically like, I'm like, a bit old school, maybe. I like to write my own server and be in full control. Um, but with Azure, of course, you have all kinds of managed servers, and you can just push up your things. Everything is managed for you, which is especially good um, if you want to like automatically scale things and you're expecting a lot of clients, right? So. Um, that's definitely there. I'm not going to show you that in this presentation today. Um, I think it's, you know, it's super exciting tech. It's super cool to use, but it's not super exciting to actually implement it because I think it's just one line of code to enable this, um, and that will, you know, push it up to your Azure account and um, make it use of that. So um, I'm going to show you just the manual way of doing things. And actually, I'm just going to start with a little demo, uh, which is interactive. Yay! Who doesn't like interactive? Um, so take out your phone. Yes, it's allowed. Typically, you're like, oh, he can't see. I'm texting right here. Now you can text and prepare this demo as well. Um, so go to gerald.fyi slash vote. Do not vote yet for optimum like experience. Um, I'm going to go there as well. But I have a super secret admin portal that you don't know about. So I also go to gerald.fyi slash vote. Let's just first go there. So you should be seeing something like this. Like, how do you like Gerald today? OK. Maybe, maybe there is tracking in who's going to say meh. OK. Maybe, maybe not. Who knows? Um, but I'm going to go into the secret portal, which is admin is 42. Please don't go here um, if you're not me. So there we go. How do you like Gerald today? It doesn't scale as good as I'd hoped, but oh, 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 people are voting. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, everyone thinks this is awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bill Gary. I love you too. Um, so yeah, by now you probably noticed that there is a little bit of a cheat mode in there. Uh, no matter which option you pick, it's always going to be awesome, right? Um, <laughs> I'm not going to have this demo fail on me. All right, but um, so if you have this, and you know, if you reload the page, you can vote again. So you know, this is just a little demo thing. Um, but if you keep it at the screen, if you vote at once, it's going to say like, "Hey, thanks for your vote," and it's kind of like blocked, right? So keep it at that screen. Um, Everyone there? All right. So if I press reset, it should now go to your phones and say, hey, voting is reset. You can start again. And the cheat mode is disabled. So now you can really let me know what you think. <laughs> All right. All right, I'm going to get off the stage. Thank you. Um, no, so this is like, you know, very simple um, project demo of what is going on here. So. All right, so we've got that. Let's look at how that works technically. Um, so this, this, this uh, that's this one, um, and this project is just very much ASP.NET with JavaScript. So don't be worried. Yes, this was the .NET room, but we're going to see a little bit of JavaScript. Um, don't worry. I'm going to I'm going to make fun of JavaScript later, um, and it all starts with well, let's actually start with. Um, the program.cs. Um, so this is like you know your typical ASP.NET application. I'm going to assume that you've seen that um, once in your life. Um, this is a very new template where all the uh, ceremonies, so all the namespace and that kind of stuff has been ripped out. Uh, so that's my, uh, why it might look a little bit funny if you've been working uh, with this earlier. Um, but you know you can see a couple of things here that should look familiar. Then we have like add signal R, right? So that's it. 
You install, I don't think you even need to install it separately anymore, the NuGet package. But if you need to install it, there is a NuGet package to install SignalR. I think it's inside of the ASP.NET um, templates already. So you just do builder services, add SignalR, boom, you're good. Um, I have this little singleton for the vote state. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, here, then you have some generic ASP.NET stuff, um, HTTPS redirection, because we're not animals. Um, use endpoints, right? So that is an important one. Uh, we're using Razor Pages, so this project is a little bit funny. This is not typically how you would set up a project like this, because this is both like your server, your client, and it has a UI, right? So that's not typically how you would do this. Typically, you would have a signal R server probably without any UI. So it's going to be a little bit funny also with like the messages going back and forth, but we'll, we'll manage. Um, and the important part here is like, hey, map this hub, right? So we have this hub that I just mentioned. This is the part that's actually working, that's actually helping you sending across all these signals without any um, 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 much effort there. And you can uh, map this to a certain endpoint, right? So slash voting hub. So if I take this and I go back to um, my little page right here, you can actually see like, hey, this is actually running on this slash voting hub. And it's going to say, hey, I, I don't know what this is, right? I need a connection ID, I need things. There is a protocol in place that we need to send here. Um, but you know, you can see it actually does something. So this is being used to actually send our things back and forth. Um, so if we look at that hub, um, then, you know, it's pretty simple. This hub is a built-in thing in SignalR. So you just inherit from that for your own hub, and then you can start working. So this is a uh, constructor, not really exciting. Here we have disable cheat mode. Um, and this method is the thing that you can call. That's what you can call now because it's inside of this hub from your SignalR connections. So we have this disable cheat mode. We have this send vote. Um, and that's all stuff that you can do. So for this one, um, actually, it doesn't really matter what we take. So the send vote is what you're sending from your client whenever you uh, do a vote. And then with the option, right? So you're going to send a one or a zero. I kept it very simple. Uh, zero is the awesome. One is the meh. Um, and then, you know, whatever cheat mode is enabled, it's always going to be zero. Um, we're going to add that to our votes with this vote state object that I have. And then I'm going to say, hey, clients all um, send async. So I'm going to send it back to all clients, which is not really, you know, performant, uh, because I'm going to send it back to all of you, and you just don't have any code to work with that. But if you would implement the code, um, then you could actually receive those. Um, so I could make this definitely more like, hey, I want to send this only to one client, which is the one that's going to... But this is demo code, right? You worry about that. I can just get away with this. Um, so you can do that, and the same thing with like the disable cheat mode, right? So I disable it here, uh, reset all the votes, and then send like, hey, it's reset. So that sends the signal back to you to release the UI again, to enable everything again, and you can start um, voting again. And also the update votes. So for my own, so that the poll updates, um, it sends the whole vote object back and resets the whole thing. So if you look at that from the web perspective, Oh, I'll, uh, for completion, I'll show you the vote state as well. So this is just a very simple thing that has the uh, cheat vote and then a simple dictionary of like the vote. So I can just keep using C sharp objects. It's all you know. Whenever it goes over the line, it will become JSON. You can deserialize it with whatever. We're going to see it in JavaScript in a little bit, and you will just can get these objects as long as they can be serialized. You can get any type of object back basically. So you can just have this. Um, then the rest lives kind of like here. Well, actually, let's see the pages first. So we have this index page with my super fancy AI-enabled algorithm to determine if you're an admin, yes or no. Um, so you have that. And there is where I make a little differentiation. So if is admin, um, then you're going to see if is admin, you're going to see how do you like Gerald today? That's interesting. Oh, right. Um, and then you're going to see that my chart, right? So this is a canvas, and this is just a JavaScript plugin that I used, a charting JS, I think, something like that, um, to, to plot that chart. And then that reset button that will send the signal to all of you. And then whenever you're the client, so the thing that you just saw on your phone, um, then you have vote below with the two buttons. So all HTML, nothing fancy going on here. And then here we have like uh, a couple of scripts. So again, if you're not admin, I'm including the voting client. So that's what you had. And else I'm going to include the, uh, include the voting server and like this whole um, charting thing, right? To set a couple of things up for that. So now the interesting thing is happening inside of JavaScript. So that's here. So let's start with, it uh, doesn't really matter, this client. And you can see, like, hey, connection is new signal R hub connection builder. And this, actually, I didn't show you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
Here under JS, you have this single R. And I think this is just like installed as an NPM package or whatever your favorite way of getting uh, half of the internet downloaded on your machine. Um, you can just get it this way and install that. So this is just a library that exists. And we have like, hey, new signal R, hub connection builder. And you can do with URL the same endpoint, obviously, else it don't know where to go. Um, and you know, typically, this URL should be like your, your actual URL that you want to get from somewhere. Now, again, because it's all the, the, the same client and server and whatnot, it knows how to connect to it directly. Um, but typically, this is where you want to put your remote URL as well. And we're going to build it. So we have this connection ready to go. You have to start it. But now we have it uh, ready to go. And here you have like your event handlers, right? So I assume that everyone kind of knows how to work with basic JavaScript. So this is like your event listeners. So whenever I'm going to click um, on this element ID, which is the awesome button, then I'm going to do connection.invoke and I can do send vote. So it's going to invoke this send vote here in this voting hub. Um, here, right? So this has to match. And then it knows, hey, I can send this vote. I can know, and now I know what to do here. So that's how that gets invoked on the server side. Um, and then you can specify all kinds of parameters, right? So because it's like very loosely coupled, um, because you, you don't really know like what's there, um, you can just have this parameter. So this is a zero. And if I just want to add something and I want to add like, hey, Bulgaria, whoops, why am I typing there? What's happening? Bulgaria is awesome, except for the people who voted meh. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, and you can just add this string parameter here, right? And you will just get this here as well. Um, so that's how you simply add parameters and, and data that you, that you need here. But that's also kind of like the um, dangerous side of this. Like if you forget something simple like this, there's no real signal haha, <laughs> um, that you will get whenever this is not working, right? Whenever you forgot something. So that's the, the, the downside of this. Um, and then whenever that doesn't happen, like we have a catch, and this is all JavaScript things, we're going to do uh, console error, it's going to print it out, but I only write good code, so that should never happen. And then I'm going to say, like, hey, status label, so thank you for your vote, I'm going to disable the buttons, um, and that's going to be it. Now the same thing, um, kind of like the other way around, so if I send the reset, so this is the other way, so here I'm connection invoking, um, whenever I want to invoke something um, on the server, but there's also the other way around, right? So if I get an event from the server, so connection.on, Reset, and we have that one not here. Reset, oh wait, what am I doing? Oh, sorry, this is the reset. Uh, uh, yeah, it's the other way around, right? So um, I'm getting confused with my own code here. That's, that's awesome. So I, I sent async, I sent this reset signal, right? So this is again the thing that has to match. And now this is here like, hey, whenever I get that reset identifier, that event, I'm going to do these things. And it says like, hey, voting has been reset, happy voting, and it's going to enable the buttons again. So that's how it works. Just for completion, let me show you the client code, but that's like, you know, that should be um, exactly the same, or the server code, I mean, um, as what we've just seen. So this is just, you know, the same connection. Um, whenever update votes come in, so that's like on the other side, whenever I send that message to all the clients, but only the server is going to respond to it, um, I'm going to, you know, set the data, set my chart.update, so you can see it real-time updating in that JavaScript thingy, uh, disable the cheat mode, et cetera, et cetera. And here, of course, you're going to say, like, I didn't show that in the other one, but you're going to have to say connection.start, right? So that's the thing to start up that connection, and, and you can then start pushing things, um, and whenever something goes wrong, then you want, probably want to know about it. All right, so that is, in basic stuff, how to get working with this. Um, all right, back to some slides before we do the rest. Do, 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 do. Perfect. There's going to be an epic demo later, which can epically fail as well, um, but I have good hopes for today. So what is .NET MAUI? Well, a couple of people already worked with it. Um, it's the evolution of Xamarin Forms. And what is then Xamarin Forms? Well, Xamarin Forms has been our offering for building cross-platform apps based on C Sharp and .NET um, for iOS, Android, UWP, and also a little bit for Tizen Linux, um, WPF, and, and Mac OS. Um, so they're on the, the, the small line because those were like not officially supported platforms, but it's all open source and our awesome community donated kind of like that code to also enable um, cross-platform development 
development for all those platforms. Um, so yeah, that, that has been our thing. You can build apps once with C-Sharp and .NET and um, release that on all of these platforms right here. And I don't know if this story is true. I like it to be true. Um, but this screenshot, I found it in the archives of the internet. Um, I don't even know. So Xamarin was a company that was acquired by Microsoft later. So I don't know if this is even from the Xamarin website or this is from the Microsoft website. Um, but the Xamarin forms always had the image of like, Boring, right? Because Xamarin forms. You can build simple applications with it, and I don't know if that's like kind of like the, the a true story. If it's also like intended to be that way, like you build only data entry applications, not super exciting. Um, but if you look at the website, there's nothing there. Um, <laughs> If you look at the website, um, then uh, you can see this, right? Like the top one, even without like reading all the text, which you probably can't, it's too small. But you can see like Xamarin Forms is best for, and then you see all kinds of boring boxes. You can see gray boxes. You can see, ooh, a blue box. Ooh. Um, so that's the most exciting thing, a blue box. And then you see like, hey, Xamarin iOS and Xamarin Android, which is like the underlying layer. You can suddenly do media players and games and all kinds of fancy stuff with maps, right? So it was marketing this way as well. Um, so it's kind of like our own fault. Right, um, but you could do much more. So the way this was all architected with Xamarin, Xamarin Forms, um, although you know maybe we were marketing it as like simple applications that you could build with it, um, you could definitely extend it as the developer yourself. You could hook into the renderers that we created for you and enable the media players and the games and the maps yourself. So people started doing that and they started to do more. Um, and but you know you could notice that Xamarin Forms wasn't really architected to do all that stuff. Um, so, you know, the, the performance would get a hit and it would take a lot of effort to actually get it performing and do all the nice things. So we took like, I don't know, six, seven, eight years now of Xamarin Forms learnings and we um, got to put that into a completely new product, which is now called .NET MAUI. Um, so hopefully we can, you know, we have all of the same stuff, all of the same capabilities, but now hopefully we can um, do it better and, and, and take all of those learnings and make it e even easier for you, right? Um, so .NET MAUI stands for Multi-Platform App UI. Um, the P is conveniently lowercase because else it would be .NET MAPAWI, which is also kind of cool, but you know, um, marketing didn't think so. So .NET MAUI it is, and this is now our cross-platform um, app UI, um, cross-platform uh, framework for building apps with C Sharp and .NET. That hasn't changed, um, but now you can do it for iOS, Android, Windows, like we call it Windows. UWP is deprecated, so we're now calling it Windows. So you know, whenever the next Windows technology is deprecated, we're not going to have to uh, rebrand this again. Uh, and macOS, right? So Windows and macOS are now primary platforms that we support the desktop as well, which is really exciting. So if you pour a little marketing sauce over that, .NET MAUI is the most productive way to build apps for all the platforms, basically. So how does it work? Very high over. Um, our paradigm for Xamarin Forms and .NET MAUI has always been, hey, on iOS you have a UI activity indicator. On and uh, Android you have a progress bar. No one? It's a circle. Why is it called a progress bar? All right. Um, and you know, you have these platform elements. Um, and we're going to have an abstraction for that, right? We call it activity indicator, so we don't get confused with circles and bars. Uh -huh. um, and you just define that activity indicator, and whenever you start running your application on iOS, it will look like an activity indicator on iOS. And whenever you run it on Android, it looks like and behaves like however it should look like on Android, right? So that's how we make it easier for you to define your UI ones and run it everywhere. So same thing for like another uh, control, and so we have like, I don't know, 40 plus controls for you to do that right now. Um, um, and the way that enables this, so kind of like the layer beneath that I mentioned, um, is like we have all kinds of wrappers and bindings for basically the um, platform APIs, and those are like thousands. So this is a lot of work to actually maintain all of this. And you have like all the system dot whatever libraries from .NET, and basically we just created additional libraries as the .NET uh, framework is kind of like architected for like iOS stuff, map kit, UI kit, all that kind of stuff. And the same thing whenever you're running on Android, we have all the libraries that bind to <clears throat> Excuse me. That bind to all the platform stuff um, and just add that as additional libraries and APIs that you can use in the .NET framework. So um, .NET MAUI it has in the name UI, so it's primarily a UI framework. But historically, we also have had um, um, all kinds of other APIs that you could use because there is a lot of sensors and um, um, functionalities across the platforms that you know are still very common. Uh, you can use geolocation for everywhere. You can use um, I don't know what do we what do we have like connectivity. Do we 
have an internet connection, um, all these APIs that you can use on all the platforms. So we made a unified U API for that as well, uh, which is historically called Maui Essentials. But now, since .NET Maui, um, well, it was called Essentials in the Xamarin world, actually. And now we still kind of refer to it as essentials, um, but it's now just you know APIs that you can use inside of namespaces inside of .NET Maui. So that name is kind of like going away. If you want to know all the history, come find me after this talk, and uh, I'll tell you all about it. So a little bit of a demo. I'm going to start to build up to the epic demo here um, and put a little bit of pressure on myself. So I created a .NET Maui app. I'll just I'll just give you the full overview first. So I'm going to close this one just to save some resources. And here I asked ChatGPT, like, hey, I'm going to create a game for a demo um, that is basically Pictionary, right? So I draw something, you guess. And it came up with, OK, drawing. Bob Ross, we all know Bob Ross, right? Like the, the little painter, happy accidents. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, and doodling. So I was like, Bob Ross doodles. I should get a wig so I have the same hair as him. That would be cool. Um, so I have created a little application for that. And it has a couple of components. I will walk through some of them. I don't have time to go over them all in, in all the details. Um, but I have this server, right? So I have this server. We've already seen that, which has a hub to do a couple of things. There's no cheat mode in this one, I promise. But there are prizes that you can win, so pay attention. Um, and this has kind of like the same um, thing, right? So we have send guess because you're going to send guesses over the line. Um, is it correct, yes or no? It's going to actually start the game and it's going to randomly select a word. Um, so you can see that I'm not actually cheating. Um, and it has all the signals and all the hub, right? But we know that already. We've learned about signal R and how that works. Um, so here, we also have a Maui client. And that client is the one that I'm going to run here on my machine. We're going to see that on the screen. Um, so we have this .NET Maui client. And that's really cool, because we have this Maui program. Um, and if you've worked with Xamarin Forms before, you would have known that, or if you, would, you probably know that it had like multiple projects for all the platforms. So whenever you want to do something for iOS, you're going to have an iOS project. If you want to do something for Android, you're going to have an Android project. Now we have a single project approach. If you want to take the Xamarin Forms approach with multiple projects, you can still totally do that. But we also have the single project approach. You can run all of that from one project, which is basically easier to manage. Um, and you can still do all the platform code, right? So in here, at the end of the day, we still have to deliver an iOS app and an Android app to the app stores, right? They're not going to say like, oh, send me an XE, .NET XE, and it's fine. We're, we'll make it run in the app store. Apple's not going to do that. Android isn't either. Um, so we still have to produce those applications. And together with that, you're going to have to provide um, metadata. So um, for iOS, that's the in, in the info P list, which has like the icon to use on your home screen, um, the name to use on the home screen, that kind of stuff. And also, if you go in here, you'll see still C Sharp and Net, but you'll see a couple of like scary looking um, namespaces because now you can suddenly use all kinds of iOS stuff, right? So I can just go in here and say using UI kit and you can use all the um, iOS namespaces and start writing iOS specific code. So you still have all the power. If we didn't uh, serve something to the .NET MAUI layer, you still have all the power to just go into your platform yourself um, because you know that API is there and you can still write all that code. But everything outside of that platforms folder is shared. So, you know, uh, this Maui program, I was already here. Um, we tried to adopt kind of like the um, pattern that we just saw with ASP.NET. So you have this application builder as well, where you can say, hey, create builder, use Maui app, use Maui community toolkit, um, some fonts, we want to add debugging, and builder.build. And also, the same thing is built in for like the dependency injections, where I can just say, hey, builder.services.addsingleton. And that's exactly the same as how it would work for ASP.NET. So if I now have a constructor that takes a I logger, then it's going to be injected automatically which is super cool, because um, cross-platform development is going to be super hard. You're going to cry yourself to sleep at night a couple of times, I'm sure of it. Um, but you know, everything that we can do to make it a little bit easier, um, that's what we're trying to do with this, basically. So that's like your bootstrapping. And then from there, you have like XAML, right? Good old XAML. At Microsoft, we love our XAML. And um, you can just compose your pages and your UI with um, all kinds of generic things. So you can put in a grid and a horizontal stack layout and a button, and then it will all show up nicely, depending on the platform that you run it on, um, it will show up the way that it's intended to be. So if I run this on Windows, let me just show you the interface right now and, and what we're going to do. Um, 
We're not going to do it yet. So I'll do, do, I'm, again, I'm building up. I'm building up, building up tension. Um, but you get an idea of what we're going to look at, and um, you're going to see like a very basic. I'm the minimalistic design person because I just can't design. I can code. I can design, um, and we'll see this application hopefully um, where I can start drawing things. And so that's here. That's the, the the gray thing, right? So I can start drawing things, and then on the right, your guesses will start coming in. Um, so they will just you'll see them, and you can laugh at people like, "Oh, this is this is wrong." Um, and then I can you know I can start a timer here, and we can all start guessing. Uh, whenever I click the start button, I have an extra application here with the Maui Hybrid application. I'm going to show you that in a little bit, which will send me the secret word through a in-app push notification um, through Signal R, um, and then you know I can have that word and I can draw it for you, and you can win a book about Blazor, which is not written by Chris Sandy, who is here. This is from Jen Jimmy Engstrom. Um, but it has a foreword by Jeff Fritz, who is here. So super cool. You can get that one if that's what you want. So that's what we're going to see. Um, and here, like, you know, this is a, this is a Dynan Maui app. So if I would run this, actually, I deployed it to my Android phone here as well. So let me see if I can quickly connect that. And it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, because you know, I, I just put this together for this demo for Windows because you know it needs a big screen to actually draw something. Um, so I didn't really optimize it for changes in view sizes and that kind of stuff. Um, but I can just you know, I here I just set it to Windows and it runs on Windows. But here I can also deploy to my Android emulator or my Android device if I connect it to my machine or my iOS device if I would connect a Mac uh, to my network and you can deploy it to that. Or I can deploy to Mac OS, which would make more sense in this case because it's a desktop app and it should work all the same without changing any code. And that is what is super cool. So this disconnecting, I think it took a while last time. So maybe I should just go on. Um, yeah, this is not going to work now. Oh, oh, it is now. Oh, there we go. So just to show you, like I deployed this earlier. Um, this is the same app as you can see, and it probably works better if I keep it sideways. Like, see, then it's kind of like the same UI, and I can still draw on it. So that's exactly the same app, but now running on Android. All right, typically they applaud here, but it's fine. It's fine. Um, <laughs> so OK, we got all that. We got all that. We, we have a basic understanding of what Dunham Maui is. And I have 20 minutes left. That's fine. That's fine. Um, so now let's look at like our next thing, right? Like, what is then? Blazor, and I think a lot of people, like, who does not know what Blazor is? See, perfect. Um, so I can just skip this. No, so what is Blazor? Uh, web development without JavaScript. That's kind of like how it's summarized often, right? Um, and because when you think of like single page applications, you have these rich applications with uh, a sidebar, a grid, dialogues, all these kinds of cool things that make for great applications on the web um, and everywhere. And if you go on that, to that same application on a mobile device, it all folds together. It's very responsive. And you will have all the same things. But it just looks different and works great on mobile. But if you think about these types of applications, then you think about Angular, then you think about React, and you think about Vue, and they all run on JavaScript because the world runs on JavaScript. Now, I can, you know, be up here and uh, make jokes about JavaScript and you know how bad it is, but in the time that I do, um, you know, there's going to be 20 new JavaScript frameworks out there, so I'm, I'm better than that. I'm not going to do that. All right. Um, so that's why, you know, to, to and it, I love joking about this, but it's not about JavaScript, right? It can be TypeScript, it can be any other language. Just the fact that you have to switch context between um, two different languages or two different things is not great. I was talking to, to uh, someone yesterday. I think he's sitting over there. Hello. Um, and he said also, like, oh, I had to work with ASP.NET and I had to change between C Sharp, which I love, and um, JavaScript. And, you know, it's, it's a evil that you need to deal with, but it's not great because you have to switch. Whenever I put something like this together with JavaScript, I kind of know how it works, but I forget because I don't use it daily. And then I'm like, oh, how do I do that again? And then I use Google to Bing. No, well, I use Bing um, to, to you know, um, find that thing um, that I'm after. And it just takes time, and it's not great. So to overcome that, um, we, and I can say we because I work at Microsoft. I had nothing to do with it, but now I can say we, um, came up with Blazor, right? And Blazor is super cool because you can keep using C-sharp. You'll never have to write um, a JavaScript if that's what you want. You still can 
if that's what you want to do, you know, there's probably something that you might want to do um, that's maybe not available in Blazor yet, or some library that you want to use, you can still do it. But if you don't have to, um, you can just keep using C Sharp. All your code will be in C Sharp. You can use the same tooling and IDE. You can use Visual Studio. You can use Visual Studio Code. All the things that you know and love, you can just keep using that. Um, you don't have to download uh, half of the internet with NPM packages. You can now just download a quarter of the internet with NuGet packages, right? So that's much better. Um, um, and then you have the like the consistent ecosystem that I already mentioned, like you know NuGets, uh, all the things that you already know about, and uh, the stability. Like 20 years of .NET, I think we've just celebrated that last year. Um, so you know .NET has been around for a long time; it will be around for um, a bit longer. So there is that to build on, and it's part I already mentioned of the ASP.NET family. So on the left, you kind of like have your web UIs, MVC is already there, Razor pages. Um, Razor is something that that Blazor is building upon. Um, single page applications we already have the templates in there already because you know we have single page applications that work with angular i think uh, maybe some other things as well i'm not too familiar with that part um, and we have all the services on the right um, HTTP APIs, which is basically all the stuff um, without UIs, which is super interesting because Signal R is on there as well, right? So it's so built into the ASP.NET ecosystem, it's actually really built into um, Blazor as well. So. How does it work? We basically, well, we have a lot of uh, variations right now, but um, it started with kind of like two. You have Blazor Server, which is kind of like your more traditional approach. You have a application running on the server side. Um, you go there, and then there is a Signal R connection um, that will go between the client and the server. Um, whenever the client clicks somewhere, um, it will go to the server like, hey, this happened. What do I show the user now? So you know that's there. Um, more of your your your, your traditional approach. Um, it all has its pros and cons. I have a little slide about this next. Um, but you can you can see where this is going, right? And if you have Blazor WebAssembly, that's more like your approach how JavaScript works. That is your application running on the client. Um, so your whole application is downloaded to the client. You can do everything there and just execute everything um, from that. WebAssembly is a technique that makes that possible. It's not invented by Microsoft. It's not specific to Blazor. It's just some Something that um, an intermediate language. So we um, basically created a compiler that compiles your C# -sharp code to whatever web assembly understands. Um, so that you can enable the scenario and run C# -sharp code inside of your browser. There's also a compiler for C++ or Rust, I think, or um, if you have your own programming language and you write a compiler, you can write that, uh, run that in the browser as well. Um, so you know, it all has pros and cons. I'm not going to read all of them to you. Um, I think you know the, the the important stuff is at the bottom. Like if you are using Blazor Server, that requires a persistent connection. So offline applications not possible, um, and it has a higher UI latency, right? Because every click has to go back and forth, and the connections are, I don't know how it's here actually, but my connection is pretty good. Um, so you're not going to really notice that. But you know, if you have to take into account um, other parts of the world where connections aren't that great, then this is something that you might want to uh, take into account. The other, on the other hand, we have Blazor WebAssembly, but you have to download like your full application, including the .NET runtime. Um, because you know the .NET runtime is now provided together with your application, um, because we don't have the .NET runtime installed on our machines anymore. Um, so you have to deliver that together with your application. As of .NET 6, um, the .NET runtime has been trimmed down to like one megabyte or something. So that's less than your average cat GIF, right? Um, so it shouldn't be that hard, but still, it's something again to take into account. You can have offline applications with that. You need that initial download, get your application over, but from there you can have an offline application if that's what you need. So we now have this, and when .NET 8 comes next month, actually in two or three weeks, um, .NET 8 is coming out, we will have a new um, 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 flavor of Blazor as well. We have Bla I keep calling it Blazor Unified, but it's Blazor United. Um, I don't know why I keep confusing it. And this is kind of like, it's super cool. But uh, probably some of the other talks will talk about that. Um, it basically combines server and WebAssembly, and you can easily shift between them, which is something you can do anyway. Like, if you decide to go one way, and you're halfway in, and you're like, no, this doesn't work for me, you can relatively easily switch between um, these kind of different flavors. And then we have um, Blazor Hybrid, um, which is kind of like even more cooler, where you can have your Blazor application or just Blazor components that you can use inside of .NET MAUI. So we have this Blazor web view, and you can just say, hey, I want to use this Blazor component inside of this Blazor web view, or you can just make a .NET MAUI application where the full um, application is a Blazor web view, and you can build your full application inside of that web view. And because Blazor is like already a .NET application, right? it's not transpiling to JavaScript or whatnot, um, 
it just runs as an actual .NET application on your device. And you can access like all the sensors. So you can access that GPS. You can access that geolocation. Um, if you are running Blazor in the browser, you're bound to that browser sandbox, which is a good thing, so that you don't go to the wrong website and it will format your hard drive. Um, but if you use a .NET MAUI Blazor hybrid application, um, then you can totally format your hard drive. So that's, that's the good news, I guess. Um, so you're not bound to all that browser sandbox uh, stuff. Obviously, you're still bound to like your app sandbox, right? So all the mobile applications have uh, permissions that you need to request to show the users, like, hey, I want to do push notifications. I want to track your location. So that stuff you definitely still have to do. So it's not without limits. But you know, if you have that, um, you can access the file system. You can do everything that you can do with a platform native app on iOS and Android and all that kind of stuff. The only kind of thing that you do is um, swap out the XAML with HTML and CSS, if you're more familiar with that, or you have an existing Blazor application that you want to repurpose this way, that's all stuff that you can do. So <clears throat> a little demo of that. I see I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to be creative. Oh, I already, I already basically told you the next section, so that's good. Um, so this is going to be the next piece of my, hey, I was good closing this, of my project is that Blazor hybrid application. So if we look at that, um, which is Maui Hybrid, here we go. It kind of like follows the same pattern, and if you're familiar with Blazor already, which was everyone, um, then you kind of like see familiar, familiarities there as well, right? So we have a www root for all of our web files. We have a main.razor. A razor thing is very much ASP.NET and Blazor. But we also see this main page.xaml. So you can see we have this Blazor web view in here, and that we point to this type local main, and that points to our main.razor. And this kind of like bootstraps our whole Blazor application. So this says like, hey, my application, my pages are here and there. And from here, you can just start writing all of your stuff in Blazor. Um, so if you go to the pages, uh, we go to the index, uh, we're going to see this in a little bit. Like, hey, we're going to do this with SignalR again. Um, we're going to get that hub connection, right? I installed the NuGet on this now, the SignalR NuGet. And you get all these built-in types. So we've seen that same hub connection. So whatever language you're going to use and you stick to these libraries that we provide, um, the syntax is going to be very much the same with URL. Um, and we're going to build. And you can see this is actually the remote URL right now. So you can connect to that. And I'm going to um, um, hook up this event. So the don't tell event, because I'm getting this secret word here on my phone. Um, and then I'm going to start the whole thing. This is a very simple application. But you can see like this, this you know, how it all works together with a .NET MAUI application. We still have the platform folder for our .NET MAUI application too, because this is an application, right? This is just an application that we can distribute through the stores if that's what we want. Um, so it has all that stuff as well. I can even mix and match, right? So if I would um, take this example right here, I if I would make this a tapped page with multiple tabs in there, I can have one tab be a Blazor web view, another tab can be like the platform native UI um, that is written in XAML, right? So you can mix and match and just make this one element or make your full application a hybrid one. Um, so this is done in Maui Hybrid. I was actually you know, supposed to talk about the Blazor part, so maybe I should have done that first. Um, this is like your Blazor application. You can see this is like, you know, again, a lot of the same stuff um, with this app.razor, which looks kind of identical to the one in Don and Maui. Um, but now you don't have the platforms folder, right? So this is like they took the two templates for the two things, smashed them together, and now we have a hybrid application. I wish it was that simple. But for you, hopefully it is. Um, and here you have all the same stuff, right? So we have these pages as well. Uh, we have Razor um, um, syntax that you can use. And this is now something that you can use inside of your .NET MAUI application as well, if that's what you want. OK, so I think with that, and seeing that time is running out, let's just have an attempt at this demo, um, which I'm a little bit nervous about. Like I said, it failed horribly once. So, but let's just, let's just do it. Let's go wild. So again, let me just pull up the slide. Doo -doo -doo -doo. Yes, we have prizes. So you can go to gel.fyi slash Bob from the Bob Ross thing, right? Um, so we have that. And I have to start my app here. There's a lot of moving parts here, so there's a lot of things that can feel. OK. Maui hybrid. OK. Whew, I'm a bit nervous. And I'm going to start this application. So again, what I just explained, whatever I'm going to um, 
do is have this application here on screen. Whenever I press the Start button, I should get a, oh, it's linking to Windows. I should get a, like, this is a very, I didn't show you, but this is a very simplistic, and I see it on the camera, very simplistic UI. It just says the secret word is, and it's going to put the word under there whenever it comes in, which I'm not going to show you. That would make it too easy. Um, and here, you know, cat. Yeah, there we go, cat. Thank you, Yavor. Um, it's not a cat, because I don't have a word. Red pick, no, no, no. Um, okay, but this is working. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so I'm just gonna click start now, see if that works too. Start, oh yes, which is a super hard word. <laughs> but I can manage, I can manage. Okay, okay, here we go. So, um, okay, I can pick colors. So let's go with this, oh, this is super hard, okay. Let's start with this, what is this? Um, okay, there we go, okay. Yes, yes, book, this is a book, thank you. Okay, so, and then, I got that point across, so where is, what is a building where they have a lot of books? Yes, the winner, well, I don't know who the winner is, they, they're anonymous, but the winner guessed the library correctly. So um, thank you, the winner, come up with your prize uh, at the end of the session, I have it right here. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of like you know, a real-time fun game that you can build with all of this stuff um, coming in here. At, at least I had fun, and I'm up here, so I don't care about all of you. Um, <laughs> so no, this is, this is a cool thing that you can do. And I'm so, book, 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 whoa, there's a lot of books. Um, so this is, this is uh, I'm happy that this went well. Um, all right, so just to complete my talk, I have a few minutes left. Um, I mixed a few things up here now while I was getting ahead of myself. But yeah, so the, the whole .NET MAUI plus Blazor thing um, is super interesting. Again, I was talking to um, uh, this gentleman yesterday, and um, because the reality is, um, oh, we just have to watch this super fancy animation that took me way too much time. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we have like Blazor right on the one side with all the web technology, um, and we have .NET MAUI on the other side, which is the other superpower with which we have the .NET runtime running on all of these devices, all of these different platforms. And now if we push them together, you can use all of the power from Blazor. If you are a web developer and you want to you know, get into um, more cross-platform development, or you want to release that app to the store, um, or the other way around, if you are in cross-platform development and you want to do more with web development and you have an existing Blazor application, you can start doing that and combining all of that power, which we call Blazor Hybrid. So with .NET MAUI Blazor, you can build cross-platform native apps that run on Mac OS, iOS, Android, and Windows, right? And that's not coincidentally all the platforms that are supported by .NET MAUI. And what's even cooler, the story that I was getting to uh, with, with the person I was talking to yesterday, was it Ola? Yeah, perfect. Um, so he said like, oh yeah, the reality is like you go to these conferences and there's someone super cool on stage um, and they're talking about the latest and greatest technology um, that you can use and, and it's all out there. It is super cool, right? And it is stuff that you can use, but there's not a lot of people that um, actually get to use it right away for their office job, right? You're still stuck maybe in Windows, WinForms, Windows Forms or WPF or all the ki that kind of stuff. Um, and the Blazor Hybrid, the Blazor WebView is not only built for Don and Maui, it's also built for WinForms. It's also built for WPF. Um, so you have to get your application up to .NET 6 um, or .NET 7 or .NET 8. Windows Forms and WPF are supported by that. But if you can get it there, then you can use the Blazor Web View um, and you can start incorporating Blazor um, components um, inside of your application. And you can kind of like start modernizing your application from the inside out instead of a big rewrite that no one knows what the budget is going to be for that or how long it's going to take. And you can start doing it piece by piece, modernizing the whole thing. Um, and at the end, you will have a full functioning Blazor application that you can roll out across all these different platforms and things. Um, you can use your re, um, existing Razor class library. So that's basically like your controls, Telerik has a lot of controls for um, this kind of stuff as well. Those controls, without any changes, you can just start using inside of your .NET MAUI, your Blazor hybrid application as well. So you can just plug it in here, install it, um, and it will run as you expect it to on a, the web, but also on your mobile application. So that's super cool. And also if you've built them yourself, you can just reuse that across all the things. And again, you have that full platform access, right? I already mentioned that. So it's kind of like the extension of Blazor. It's the third option next to um, Blazor server, Blazor, Hi uh, Blazor WebAssembly, and then we're going to have Blazor United with, with the release of .NET 8, and we have Blazor 
um, hybrid with, with this as well, which is all built on .NET 6 and .NET MAUI, of course, now .NET 7, .NET 8 also got it, um, but we have all that. Um, I basically went over this already. Um, what I really want to emphasize again is like, you know, did, did this application, if you're going to run it on um, your, um, 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 as a Blazor hybrid application, is not going to have a server process in the background, right? The server that I just showed you um, is hosted in Azure, so there is, it's hosted on IIS, I don't know, I guess I assume something like that. Um, so it's there, it's installed, it's deployed, it's hosted, um, and if you run it on your local machine, you're going to see that little terminal window pop up that is a web server, and then it's going to interact with that, right, because it's a, a web thing. But a Blazor application, it, it's .NET, right, and we have the .NET runtime running on all these platforms. So it can just run as a .NET application on these things. It will just be as performant, it will be as great, it doesn't need to go through a WebAssembly layer or any kind of that stuff. Um, there doesn't have to be an extra process that we interact with. It just runs as a .NET application. Um, so no HTTP request, so you can totally build an offline application with this as well, even if it's Blazor, even if, if it's web, um, doesn't really matter. You can build um, offline applications with this. So in that regard, it's closest to kind of like your um, Blazor WebAssembly option, right? Um, and the only kind of like the only thing web about it is um, um, the HTML. Uh, the CSS that's being rendered on screen. So that's also where the challenge is, like how are you going to make that nicely and give the users that really platform experience um, on their device because that is, you know, if you think about the bad apps that you've had on your phone and you're like, oh, this is nothing, it's usually a one that loads things in a web view, so that's like, you know, there's challenges there. The, on the other hand, um, you get a lot of stuff for free. If you're using .NET MAUI and the platform stuff, you, and not, even if you're not using .NET MAUI, if you're using iOS stuff, uh, Xcode and Objective-C, you have to do stuff to make it responsive, right? Like if you're going to do the orientation that I just did, like hold your phone this or this, um, it's going to have to have some changes on how the layout is, is, is done. Um, but if you do this on like your Blazor hybrid, like, I don't know if it does it for this. Oh, see, it does. So it's going to be, oh, wait, 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 wait. I can do this. It's still casted, I think. You can also see that I was not cheating. It actually told me library. There we go. Um, so this is like the Blazor hybrid application, right? And you can now see that um, it's all folded because I keep it like in portrait mode. Um, so now we have this little menu right here. But if I uh, turn it over, then it will get that menu out of there because now it's like, hey, there is enough space to actually show that menu. Um, so this has like Bootstrap built in, right? That's all stuff that you can get for free with all this responsiveness. If you don't want to use Bootstrap, you use another um, framework if that's what you want. But you get all that stuff for free suddenly, that responsiveness and all that stuff. So, you know, there's pros and cons to basically every approach here. All right, so we've got that, we've got the demo. Got a book, and you're now like, awesome, yes, I can see it. You're, you're energized for the rest of the day, right? Oh, thank you. Great, great, great. Still no applause, but don't worry. Um, <laughs> so the, the, a much more advanced and, and cool um, demo is uh, this one. Um, so this is uh, all open source, which is kind of like a showcase, and we use this also for um, 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 like performance testing whenever we have a new .NET version. So this came out, I think, with .NET 6. Um, I think we've updated for .NET 7, and we will probably update it for .NET 8 as well. Um, and this doesn't only have like the .NET MAUI bits. This is like a full solution, which kind of like mimics your podcast app. Um, so you, this has a website, which is built with Blazor. Um, and you can listen together as well, which is built with Signal R. So actually, I have, I have two minutes left. So let me just show you. It also has a hosted version. Uh, so I can just go to .NET podcasts.com, I think. Um, and whenever you go there, this is a hosted version. So this is a landing page, and this doesn't actually, you know, do anything much um, because this is just to kind of like mimic your thing. Um, but if you go in here to the top right and you click sign in, you'll get to the actual application. And this is built with Blazor, and it has actual like podcasts in here. So if we search for rocks, we have .NET Rocks in here. See. Um, uh, um, Richard Campbell is here, and you can actually go in here. I, the th feed is updated sometimes, like not 
like super uh, often, no, oh, February 9th. <laughs> so it has been a while, but that's not the point here, right? So you can uh, get these actual episodes. They are get gotten from the actual feeds, um, and you can start listening here. So you can do that, and you can subscribe, right? And again, it doesn't really do much because um, you don't have an actual account. It was just log in, and you were here. So this is just for your session. But you can see, like, hey, this is playing. And for some reason, on my laptop, it never does. Um, but it should be, you know, it should be progressing here. And you can actually hear the audio um, if you have like your um, earphones plug in and that kind of stuff. Um, and the cool thing is, you can also listen together. So you can go here, listen together. I can say, hey, create a new room. I can say, Gerald, and you will get a code. And um, you can come over and get this code, and we can listen together. So it will sync wherever we are in this podcast, and we can do together like these reactions, and you will see that on your screen as well, which is done through Signal R again, right? Um, so we can kind of like exchange how we feel about this episode. So that's really cool. Um, but this is, and then we have like this website. There is the, um, there, it has a mobile app, which is basically built twice. Um, so one with like full .NET MAUI, which translates everything into native components, uh, platform components, and one uh, Blazor hybrid app that shares all the code with like the website. So it, uh, you can see how that would look like in different architectures, right? Um, and it has all the backend services. You can deploy it to your own Azure account. Um, don't forget to turn it off if you're done playing. Ask me how I know. It will burn through your credits like crazy. Um, so yeah, that's a super cool example that you can check out. Um, so that always begs the question like, hey, what do I choose when? Um, for reach, you know, if you want to just do something in a, um, uh, which, Come, goes out to like the most people do something in a web browser, so probably choose Blazor. Um, if you want to, you know, get the power of the platform but still have that reach or reuse your web skills, go with Blazor Hybrid. You can do that little bit of both. And if you want to full power of a platform, choose a framework that really belongs on that platform, um, like Maui, like WinUI, like WPF, and all that kind of stuff. I'm already over time. Thank you so much for joining. I hope you will have a rest, uh, great rest of the conference. Yes.